Okay, so good afternoon or good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. This is another Crypto Wednesday show. This is Sander de Bruin. Today I'm in still in the Netherlands because we have semi-lockdown, but I'm in the area of The Hague. So calling in from the house. Uh, we're happy to have Jacob today as our guest speaker. So Jacob, thank you for spending some time. I know it's early also for you in that part of the world, but we really appreciate that. Um, so for everybody that's here in the live show or coming in, um, we have about 60, 90 minutes in today's show. If you have any questions, um, just for the first part of the show, put them in the, in the chat box so we can put them on the, on the table for Jacob and our other speakers to answer. And in the second part of the show, we will get some of the alumni speakers and our industry friends also involved. We can open up the microphones, we can open up the videos for you guys to interact with, with uh, Jacob today. Uh, and in the meantime, if we get Zoom, Zoom bombers in, you know, we throw them out, we give them a big smile and we wish them all the, all the best, of course. Um, and for you guys, let's do a quick intro. Gordon, also you, you and myself, let me, let me kick off. So for people that don't know me yet, my name is Sander de Bruin. I was born and raised in the Netherlands. Got involved in the crypto and blockchain industry a couple of years ago through some industry friends. Uh, started with some investments and ICO projects, did some business development. And just recently, and Gordon mentioned that already last week, and we're going to talk that talk about it in the upcoming weeks. Just recently, I onboarded with a great European project from the Netherlands. It's called Europe Chain. I onboarded as an ambassador to help them to uh, create some market traction. So we will also have that in the sh uh, show for the upcoming weeks. We will reveal some of that. Um, I think it's a, it's a really cool project. Um, and besides that, I'm involved in the well-being industry, in the wellness and nutrition industry. So I'm happy always to interact with people that are in the same vision and, and so forth. So Gordon, I, I don't have to ask where you are because we are both in the same countries. You're still in LA, it's still early. But how, how are you this week, my friend? Uh, I am doing okay. I am, my family is rejoining me tonight, actually. I don't know if that's good for them coming back to LA from Europe, but it's good for me after several months of separation. So I'm happy. Uh, just briefly for everyone, I'm Gordon Einstein. I'm an attorney who specializes in crypto and blockchain law. Um, I would like to say it's not the Gordon Show though, so we're gonna focus on our good guest, Jacob Stein, who's a long-term friend and colleague of mine. Uh, Jacob is a attorney who specializes in international sophisticated tax planning and asset protection and structuring. I'll let him kind of go into more depth about who he is and what he does for this show, but I, I'm excited to have him on. I, I've known him for a while. He's He's slick, he's good, and he's very insightful. Very low key, but if you listen to him, it's like Buddha dropping little law of wisdom bombs, which is a beautiful thing. And yes, I'll, I'll echo what Sander said, you know, I don't necessarily mind Zoom, Zoom bombers, to me, they're like fresh meat. So if you wanna set yourself up for like a verbal ripping and a dispensing with, God bless you. Um, let's, just because we have an hour and a half, let's just kind of dive right into it. Uh, Jacob, you were kind enough to sort of, you know, prep me with some questions some, and some other good material. And I want to point out, I have your book right here. Oh, wow. Yeah. You may be the only person who purchased that book. I, and I read it. Huh. I, 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 I purchased it and read it. I actually think even I have not read it. it. <laughs> so, you know, this is 2016, maybe Biden, you need to update this. But Jacob, please, um, I'm handing, I, you know, just you know how the show goes. I, I always say I won't interrupt, but then I get interested and I start interrupting. So don't, I'm sure you can roll with it, but Introduce yourself, tell everyone about you, and we'll go from there. Well, thank you, Gordon. And first of all, yes, please interrupt me. I would like this to be more engaging and interactive, right? And not just a monologue. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Jacob Stein. I'm an attorney practicing in Los Angeles. I'm the managing partner of Alliance. We are a global law firm. Uh, my own practice, my law practice, focuses on representing private wealth transactions. Uh, representing high and ultra high net worth families and individuals, both in the United States and Europe and Asia. And we do pretty much everything you can think of uh, for these families from the standpoint of working with their wealth, preserving their wealth, uh, engaging in sophisticating, uh, usually international tax planning, moving money around the world and such. Um, our clients tend to be fairly sophisticated. So the structures tend to be fairly sophisticated. And I'm hoping today we can get uh, a dive into some of these structures at least. Uh, so Gordon, where would you like to start today? Well, I, you know, I always like to do kind of a little biography. How did you get into 
sort of the, the dream niche of law? Uh, you know, I, I don't even remember how I got into law. Uh, I mean, to be honest, and this is not something I share publicly that often, I had a really hot business law professor in college, mm -hmm. um, got really good grades in the business law classes. And she kind of said, you know, Jacob, you should go to law school. And I'm like, okay, hot lady, whatever you say, I'll go to law school. And that's, you know, here I am today. Just the so let me jump in. Here's my first interruption. Life, right? I took constitutional law too, my favorite class, because there was a cute girl in there. Hmm. So, well, women situation. do shape our lives in every conceivable way, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, that's but how, then how did you law. get into this particular? Uh, so panel. you know, I started off as a tax lawyer in one of the big uh, international law firms, and then uh, later on, when I uh, started my own practice and joined my former partner, he practiced uh, a lot in asset protection. He was actually one of the very first lawyers in the United States to approach asset protection as a standalone, separate practice area. Before you know, back in the '80s, no one has heard of asset protection. It was not just something people did or thought of. Um, and so in the late eighties, it sort of started evolving that, hey, we, there is an area of the law that help, can help people set up asset ownership structures to shield assets from claims of government agencies, plaintiffs and creditors. So by the time I joined him in, uh, I think the early odds, he already had a well-established asset protection practice. I had no intention of practicing asset protection, but it sort of happened you know, on its own because we were practicing together and I, you know, sort of fell in love with this practice area. I like the fact that there are so few experts in this practice area around the world. You know, and frankly, 20 years later today, it's pretty much the same people that were there 20 years ago, right? This practice area has not changed a lot. There are probably a couple dozen uh, really good lawyers around the world who practice asset protection. And, Am I hearing that right? A couple dozen around the world? A couple dozen that do, the, do this on a full-time basis and do this at a high enough level, you know, to, to be well-known and be relevant. I'm sure there are a lot of lawyers out there, at least today, that have asset protection as a practice area, let's say in addition to being business lawyers or in addition to being tax lawyers or estate planning lawyers. But as a standalone practice area where you do this on a full time, you have other lawyers in the firm who do this full time. There are still very few people who do this uh, like this consistently. Hmm. And maybe, maybe it's self-evident, but maybe it's not. Can you give the a pithy definition of asset protection? Pithy. Pithy is my specialty. Oh, yes, uh, indeed. So... Uh, Asset protection is a fairly narrow um, subject. Asset protection deals with how do we get to keep what is ours, right? How do we hold on to our stuff? So we're not really talking about tax planning. That's, that is a way to hold on to your assets, but that's a separate discussion, separate topic. Uh, we're talking specifically how to protect your assets from claims of plaintiffs, creditors, and government agencies, right? So when something bad happens, what can you do to keep uh, your assets. Um, if you go and search asset protection on the internet, I think you will come across a lot of service providers, a lot of websites that will promise you the moon and the stars and will promise to bulletproof your assets as they call it and make them unreachable. Uh, but real asset protection, substantive asset protection, it is rarely about making assets unreachable, at least today, it used to be maybe 20 years ago. Today, asset protection is primarily about placing yourself into a really good negotiating position. So when that plaintiff or creditor comes after you, um, the assets are protected. Uh, I'll give you an example, if you like. We just represented um, a fairly well-known celebrity. And uh, you know, his directive to us was that you know, I'm buying a new home here in Los Angeles, and I do not want the world, I don't want the paparazzi to know that this is my new home and that I live here. We did absolutely everything one can think of to provide him privacy and anonymity for that home, right? So his name is not anywhere on public records with respect to this home. It's not in any of his utility or phone bills connected to that address. There's just no visible connection uh, between him and that home. The next day there was a, you know, a, a press article that he bought a new home with the pictures of the home and the address and everything. 
well, because you know, in this day and age, hiding, right, disguising things, it's pretty pretty difficult. It may be possible, but for like a high profile celebrity, so let me jump in. What would, the, around the, all the time. My expression in the tech space is obscurity is not is not security. I think that's a very good uh, way of putting it. That's right. So what we're looking to do in asset protection, and I think perhaps it's a common misnomer, we're not looking to hide assets, right? We're not looking to go to Home Depot, you know, get a shovel and dig a hole in the desert, right? That, that's not our objective. Um, the objective is to have structures that work substantively, right? So for example, we will always operate from the presumption that uh, the other side, whoever is going after our client's assets, will know right away what it is that we did to protect our client's assets, right? And uh, there are, in most countries, there are legal processes in place that will allow a plaintiff or a creditor to discover what has been done, right? To depose a debtor and ask them questions. So we have to presume that they will know what we've done to protect the assets, and it still has to work, right? So asset protection is not about hiding assets, although it's not a bad thing. You know, hiding assets is not a bad thing. We've seen in so, so many cases where if the plaintiff cannot find our client's assets, they will not bring the lawsuit in the first place, or they will be willing to settle, negotiate, and walk away from our client. But we can't rely on that. Well, right? because uh, I, I guess let me jump in. It's, if, if you're dealing with a U.S. defendant who's here and you initiate discovery, um, between the debtor's exam and everything else, is there any realistic chance of hiding assets if you're dealing with a U.S. party who's located in the U.S.? Well, so I think this applies both uh, to defendants in the U.S., Europe, pretty much everywhere, um, because a lot of these legal remedies are available around the world to plaintiffs and creditors, uh, not just in the United States. But so what, for example, we just had a client uh, three weeks ago, I think. He left the United States and he is now temporarily residing uh, let's say in Central Europe, I'm not going to specify, specify where, um, mm -hmm. with the idea being that if he was here, he would be available for what's known as a debtor's exam. This is where the plaintiff can ask him all sorts of questions about his assets, and our client is obligated to answer those questions under penalty of perjury. So he left the United States so that a U.S. court no longer has personal jurisdiction over our client. Right? And they cannot force him to appear in the debtor's exam. They cannot force him to answer questions. And he's the only source of information for them about what happened to his assets. Interesting. So, okay, so let's take us through asset, asset protection 101, and then we'll go 201, 301. Like what, what's, the, what's the basic framework? Okay, so the most fundamental premise of any asset protection structure is that we want to make our client's assets, not his, right? We want to make sure that the assets no longer belong to our client. That's the most basic, most foundational premise. If you own an asset, and I think this is true in most every country, uh, once a plaintiff obtains a judgment, with the judgment, they can go after the assets that you own. A government agency can go after assets that you own. But if there are assets out there that you do not own, that technically do not belong to you, your plaintiffs and your creditors and the government agencies cannot go after those assets because they're in yours. So every single asset protection structure aims to take an asset that our client owns and makes it into an asset that our client does not own. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not difficult to do, right? You can give away your assets to a stranger on the street and you will no longer own them and no one mm -hmm. can take them from so the tricky part is not just to give away your assets, but to give away the assets in such a way so that you actually retain control. You retain the ability to transfer the ownership of the assets back into your name when you choose to do so. We usually want to engage in transfers of assets without any tax consequences, regardless of what country you live in. Right. So that's the very sort of basic foundational premise of asset protection. That's what every single asset protection structure anywhere in the world aims to do, to remove our client from the ownership of his assets, but allow him to retain control. So, uh, you know, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Questions first. I, I was, uh, you know, the avoiding tax consequences is kind of interesting. I, I wonder if there's sometimes a little bit of protection at paying a de minimis tax associated with the transfer to almost glue it in place. And we've taken approaches like that 
with crypto. Like just for example, and it's it's not directly related, but you know, for companies that are doing a coin offering, if they want to strongly assert that the tokens they're offering aren't securities, we tell them pay income tax on the money you raise, pay a low rate of income tax in a jurisdiction that's friendly. But that's a strong argument. It's not a security because when you sell securities, you don't. When you, a company, issue your own securities and sell them, you don't pay tax on your issuance. It's just a capital transaction. So it's kind of a niche question, but is there ever a role for paying some amount of tax just to glue your position into place? So that's a great question. And uh, the answer becomes very specific to the jurisdiction that you are in. So for example, in California, where I practice, tax records are not available to a plaintiff or a creditor or even a government agency outside of the Department of Treasury. Um, in other US states and in other countries around the world, tax records may be available, right? Jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And if tax records are available, we want to make sure that the tax records will be consistent with whatever story we are painting for the plaintiff. So in that case, yes, we may have to engage in transactions that will have tax consequences. And certainly if we want to present the records on our own sort of voluntarily to a judge, the, trans the transaction we engaged in will have a lot more substance and he is less likely to set it aside if we can show that we suffered some sort of tax consequences as a result of engaging in that transaction. Okay, uh, so and then you, the, 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 they're kind of good facts sometimes. That, one sometimes. more time. It, it's what I would call, you're, you're creating good facts. Well, good facts and we're creating substance, right? Economic right. substance by paying taxes. And you also have to consider the fact that often asset protection does not take place in a vacuum, right? The client mm -hmm. that we are representing may have other needs. So maybe we are combining asset protection with estate planning or estate tax planning or income tax planning, right? Um, or some other type of planning. So then we will be trying to accomplish several objectives along the way. And then maybe we are paying taxes anyway because of uh, our planning objectives. Fair enough. Now, going from plain vanilla to esoteric. Okay, I, I understand the basic principle or the axiom that you're changing title, you're changing ownership, but you're kind of maintaining a beneficial interest of some sort and control. Going, start me with some plain vanilla techniques for accomplishing that. Okay, so let, let me first start off by telling you what not to do. Sure. Um, you know, and this is literally after a few thousand conversations with the clients and prospective clients. Uh, our, our clients always all have the same uh, measure of self self help that they want to bring into these asset protection transactions. So first of all, pretty much everyone we represent, the very first question they often ask is, "Can't I just transfer my assets to my kids? Like, why set up uh, expensive uh, structures?" when you know eventually i will leave assets to my kids anyway so you know today i'm being sued fine i'm just going to transfer the assets to my kids today and be done with it uh, so the downside of an approach like that transferring assets to the kids or really to any individual can be some other family member or a friend is that first of all there likely will be tax consequences to the transfer uh, and second you're not placing your kids or your friend or whoever you transfer the assets to in a position where they may be sued to recover the transferred assets, right? Because usually, at least in the United States and the British Commonwealth jurisdictions and in many civil law countries, uh, the lawsuit to recover the transferred assets will be a lawsuit against the transferee, the person you transfer the assets to, right? So, you know, and I often ask my clients, would you like to give your kids the experience of being a defendant in a lawsuit because this is exactly what will happen, right? So we usually want to avoid transferring to people. And instead we want to transfer into some sort of an abstract legal structure. So let me pause here for a second. Two, two, two questions. The, um, if you're doing this, heaven forbid, prior to a lawsuit, lawsuit or an expectation of a lawsuit, you're actually being amazingly proactive. Does that take the edge off what you're saying is question number one. And then question number two is now that the state tax exemption is something like 11 million, 15 million, I forget exactly what it is. Does that potentially take the edge off? So yes, planning uh, ahead of time is certainly very, very helpful. 
right? Um, because planning ahead of time uh, makes it more difficult, maybe even impossible for any plaintiff or creditor to file that lawsuit to recover the transferred assets. And if that's the case, it doesn't matter who the assets go to. But the problem is that once you transfer assets to another person, uh, in many countries, you will have tax consequences as a result of that transfer. And second, you do lose control. And if you recall, a few minutes ago, I said that our one of our objectives in asset protection is that our client remains in control of his assets. And I will tell you from, again, 2,000 conversations, that's one of the very first questions any client will ask is, how do I keep control of my stuff? Right, because for a lot of them, asset protection is sort of uh, a necessary evil, if you would, right? It's just something we have to do, but we don't really want to. Like no one wakes up on a Sunday morning and says, you know, I really want to protect my assets. That's what I want to do today, right? Usually it's more of a need, right? You are seeing some problems coming down uh, in the future, or you're already experiencing a loss. So you're being uh, reactive. But, uh, you know, go going back to your questions, uh, you know, if you're transferring ahead of time and there is no risk today on the horizon, yeah, transfer to the kids, it's okay. But there are some downsides like losing control and having tax consequences. So for that reason, we have a strong preference to using trusts uh, in various legal entities and not giving it to the kids directly. And, and that's the direction you were heading. Uh, so you, you said not human, but abstract legal contracts. So go ahead on that. Cool, thanks. Um, so the, the two, I'll kind of focus on the two most frequently used structures in asset protection because I think they're a really good illustration of how this stuff works uh, and they are most frequently used. So you see them a lot. And this would be trusts and uh, LLCs. Mm -hmm. So let's start with LLCs actually first. It's a simpler concept, simpler structure. So an LLC, for those of you who are in foreign countries, stands for a limited liability company. Uh, at least in the British Commonwealth jurisdictions in the United States, it's uh, called a limited liability company. Um, in Germany, it's called the GmbH. In other countries, it may have uh, other names. Um, and an LLC is sort of a hybrid between a corporation and a partnership. It has some characteristics of a corporation, some characteristics of a partnership. But what's really cool about the LLC from an asset protection standpoint is that in most countries that have limited liability companies, at least certainly in the British Commonwealth countries. Uh, there are laws that provide that an interest in a limited liability company cannot be taken from you. There's simply no such remedy available to a plaintiff. They just cannot take your LLC interest from you. It is not an asset that is available for attachment, right? So the plaintiff gets a judgment against you. They start looking for what assets you have so they can collect on that judgment. And they find out that one of your assets is an interest in a limited liability company. And it doesn't matter what that company owns, right? Because the company owns what the company owns. All right, so I, I got to break in because this, this is fascinating. Is, is the, I, I would imagine regular corporation shares are subject to attachment. Is, is that true? Uh, shares in regular corporations are subject to attachment. There are some exceptions, like for example, in Nevada, you can have what's called a closed corporation yes. and it's treated the same as an LLC, at least under Nevada law. We don't know if other jurisdictions will respect that, but states and countries that have LLCs and in the British Commonwealth, Commonwealth countries, uh, partnerships also are protected by the same law. So if you have an interest, let's say in a limited partnership, like a, a private equity fund in the US and the Caymans, wherever it may be, an interest in that limited partnership is also not attachable by a creditor. They just cannot take it from you. All right, so let me, is the idea behind that, that because these are partnership or partnership like structures, structures which are voluntary associations of individuals going to business that they, want, they don't want to force anyone into a partnership with a partner that they don't want or didn't anticipate? Or what's the rationale? So, right, that was the logic. I mean, this uh, sort of body of law of protecting partnership interests, I think started back in like the late 1800s. Mm. Um, uh, when we had the, when society only had corporations and general partnerships mm -hmm. and the idea was like, we don't want a creditor coming in and taking the interest of a general partner because they acquire not only the economics of that interest, but the vote of a general partner, it can be very disruptive mm -hmm. to an organization that's run as a general partnership, right? We want to keep outsiders out of it. 
Uh, with a corporation, you don't have that issue because you have centralized management. It doesn't matter who the shareholders are, you mm -hmm. still have your officers and directors uh, continuing to run the entity. So that protection was never extended to corporations. It was extended to partnerships originally. Then in the 19, I don't know, 20s, 30s, when limited partnerships were invented, it was extended to limited partnerships. And then in the 70s and 80s, when LLCs came about, it was extended to uh, LLCs as well. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, that's the or origin of that law. That's fascinating. Um, Go ahead. So the interest in the LLC cannot be taken from us. Um, and, you know, perhaps in some jurisdictions, some small exceptions have been carved out, but by and large, that is the law in most countries that have LLCs. So what can the plaintiff take? Because we have to give them some uh, satisfaction, right? Because they have a judgment against, that, against us. So what a plaintiff can get is they can place a lien on our interest in the LLC, right? So and the, this lien will sit on our interest in the LLC and whenever the LLC makes a distribution to us, the lien will intercept that distribution and force it to go to the plaintiff. And so this lien works in the form of a court order. It's an order issued not to our client, it's issued to the company that he has an interest in. And it basically says, hey, a limited liability company or a limited partnership, next time you make distributions to all of your investors, don't actually give the money to Gordon, give the money to his creditors. Right. Um, so it doesn't sound like that's a great result for us because they still get all of the distributions coming from this entity. But you have to keep in mind that if our client is in control of that company, what is he going to do? He's going to stop making distributions, right? Because why would he make a distribution knowing that it is going to go to someone else, right? To a plaintiff or a creditor. So uh, LLCs are a fairly good form of asset protection. It's not perfect. It's not 100% bulletproof. But probably nothing is. But given okay, how so simple- Here's another question. If you have a foreign LLC, does that foreign LLC necessarily respect a US court's or foreign court's order, that, in, that interception order? So now we get into fairly complex like area of the law, right? Enforcement of judgments in other countries, the New York Convention, the Hague Convention, even within the United States, we have what's called the full faith and credit clause of the constitution. So one state has to honor a judgment from a sister state. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and we all have heard that there are some jurisdictions that have better LLCs than others, right? So in the United States uh, and probably worldwide, Delaware is the leading jurisdiction for LLCs. I would venture to guess something like 80% of the world's LLCs are created in Delaware. Um, more recently in the U.S., Wyoming and Nevada have been very competitive in the LLC marketing arena. Um, outside of the United States, uh, Nevis is probably one of the leading jurisdictions today, um, perhaps the Caymans. Um, but, you know, so let's take a quick look at, uh, first of all, why some jurisdictions appear to be more attractive. And then to Gordon's question, does it actually make a difference if you live in a different jurisdiction? So uh, why do people go to Delaware for, uh, let's say, legal entities? So it does primarily have to do um, for liability protection. Like, for example, if you're setting up an investment partnership, right, and you're the promoter of this investment partnership, there are all sorts of protections built in for you in Delaware law. So if, for example, you're worried about one day facing a lawsuit from your investors, you want Delaware law to apply to your LLC because there's just gonna be a lot more protection built in for you and more difficult for an investor to mount that loss. For folks looking for asset protection and anonymity specifically, uh, Delaware and Wyoming become very relevant because these are the only two jurisdictions, uh, at least jurisdictions of note, I think maybe New Mexico does it as well, uh, that allow us to form an entity on a fully anonymous basis. So, I mean, Delaware. Um, Sorry, I just want to make sure yeah, I heard you. Delaware and maybe New Mexico? Delaware, Wyoming, and uh, to a lesser extent, New Mexico. Got it. Okay. Uh, allow us to form an entity on a fully anonymous basis. So, you know, the European countries have long pushed for the United States to be placed on the OECD blacklist mm -hmm. because of Delaware, because we have a jurisdiction locally that allows us to set up entities on an anonymous basis. That is not allowed anywhere else in the world. And certainly not today. Maybe 
some years ago when uh, in many jurisdictions you could still have like bare share of corporations, uh, which is in, to a large extent has gone away pretty much everywhere. Um, but nowhere that I am, at least where we do business, which is you know in a lot of places around the world, uh, can you form an entity nowadays on an anonymous basis? You in the United in States, <laughs> in Delaware, you can, right? So in the United States, and we are a bit of an exception, we are much more privacy oriented than, than most people think we are. Mm -hmm. We, for example, have here in the United States by far the strongest banking privacy laws of any country. It is not Switzerland. It was actually technically never Switzerland who had the strongest banking privacy law. It was always the United States hmm. and still true today. And nowadays we're seeing so many clients from all over the world moving their banking to the United States because all the other countries now disclose information to the tax authorities. Um, so in the United States, ownership of legal entities that are not publicly listed on a stock exchange is never available to the public, right? That's always private information. It's always anonymous. But what Delaware and Wyoming allow us to do is not to connect any name to a registered limited liability company. So even the identity of a manager does not have to be disclosed, right? So the world only knows the name, let's say, of the law firm that organized the LLC, but not the name of any particular individual who is connected to that LLC, which makes it incredibly difficult for any third party, even for a government agency, often to connect our clients to specific Delaware or Wyoming LLCs. Mm. So that's, you know, for someone seeking privacy, anonymity, right, camouflage of title, that's a nice way to go. And it's a very simple structure. I mean, it's very inexpensive to set up, let's say, a Wyoming LLC. Uh, Wyoming charges something like, I don't know, 100 bucks a year, maybe less uh, for an LLC. The legal fees should not be that high on setting up an LLC. So it's just a very simple, easy way of setting up a structure, transferring ownership of your assets into that structure. And you get some very nice measurable level of protection with that. Um, if we want more protection than what an LLC will give us, then we're going to ramp it up and move up to a trust. So let's talk about trusts a little bit. Uh, so if you are in a in an English common law jurisdiction, in part of the you know the Commonwealth somewhere, you should be well familiar with trusts. They've been part of the English common law for hundreds of years, uh, but not every country has the concept of a trust. So just very briefly, a trust is a private contractual agreement between two parties. Uh, in most ways, it's really no different than any private contractual agreement, right? In most ways, it's not uh, that dissimilar to, I don't know, joint venture agreement, right? Where the trust becomes unique is that it creates a fiduciary relationship and imposes fiduciary responsibilities on one of the parties to this contractual relationship to the trustee. Um, so trusts, Nowadays do exist in most everywhere around the world, right? Certainly in all of these uh, offshore financial service uh, havens, like in the Caribbean, in the South Pacific, uh, in some of the islands around Europe, and you know islands in the Indian Ocean, pretty much everywhere where people go to set up entities, set up offshore structures, and the like. And trusts are certainly available in every British Commonwealth jurisdiction and in the United States. So why is a trust better? So when we are using a trust to protect assets, first of all, it will always be what's called an irrevocable trust as opposed to a trust that is revocable. And with an irrevocable trust, what happens is that once the assets are transferred to this irrevocable trust, our client owns nothing. Meaning that his financial statement goes completely blank which is different than when you transfer assets into a limited liability company, right? When you transfer um, a bank account, let's say, into a limited liability company, there is still something that appears in your financial statement, right? Your interest in the limited liability company that you own is still in your financial statement. And it may give a lot of creditors pause and they may not want to pursue it. They may not want to, to know, they may not know what to do with it, right? Um, or if they try to go after it, they may be unsuccessful there's still something on the financial statement that may make our client look like an attractive target. But if that same bank account is moved into an irrevocable trust, the asset entirely comes off our client financial statement. And now he's a much less likely target of a lawsuit. You know, we represented a, an elderly gentleman uh, recently 
um, early 90s involved in a car accident, you know, ran his uh, car into a group of pedestrians, which apparently you're not supposed to do in California. And he got sued. Hey, so, hey, well, uh, can, can I make it like a street political protest joke or is that not? Sure. A no, I, 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 this is your show. That I won't, but go ahead. No, you're, you're generally not supposed to ram your car into groups of people in the street. That's, that's a good point. Good point. Let's go with that. Um, but no, there were no significant injuries. No one was super badly hurt, but lawsuits were obviously filed because that's what, you know, plaintiff's attorneys do. That's how they earn a living. And uh, our client did not have a lot of insurance coverage on his car. So he was facing about a million and a half in claims. And he had a very nice home that he was living in, probably about a $6 million home. And we transferred the ownership of the home into an irrevocable trust. And the plaintiff, uh, at some point in time, they were not backing off. They wanted their million and a half. At some point in time, they demanded our client's financial statement. The statement was produced to them, signed under penalty of perjury, and the financial statement was pretty much blank. There was almost nothing on it. And they settled the case later that day for like $30,000. Okay, so the, the, I mean, the lawyer me has to ask, I mean, it sounds like this guy's name was on title before it went to irrevo irrevocable trust. It's kind of a no brainer. Of course, that right? from... so this happened, the transfer, correct, Gordon, the transfer to the trust happened very last minute. And I think most plaintiffs and creditors would do their due diligence, right? And will run a title search and see what happened recently and so forth. This plaintiff's lawyer never did that. They just looked at the financial statement and said, oh, wow, wow, this guy has no assets. We better settle and move on to our next case. Mm. But this was, uh, you know, th this example was just to illustrate the point that one of the main advantages of the irrevocable trust is that it entirely removes the asset from the financial statement, which so in a negotiating session is a huge advantage. Right? Is there an advantage to stacking these having putting your having a trust sorry putting your assets into an LLC and then transferring your LLC interest into a trust so that would be asset protection 301 not 201, am, 201. I, am, I, am I jumping the line here <laughs> uh, hey, hey, so, if we're missing some substructure go back and sorry no, it's, no, no, no. it's, it's fascinating you, know, you got my gears uh, turning <laughs> listen just kind of to take a quick step back back there are probably two, three dozen structures that we routinely use to protect assets, right? And we cannot possibly cover all of them. I'll cover some more other than trust LLCs, but these are kind of the most fundamental structures. Mm -hmm. And I think a great illustration of how asset protection works. So that's why I wanted to focus on trusts and LLCs. And to answer you know, your suggestions, uh, you are absolutely correct. We very often will place assets into an LLC and then place the LLC into a trust. And that's usually done not to enhance uh, the protection that we are getting. This is usually done to allow a lot more control over the assets that have been transferred into the asset protection structure. But, uh, because, for example, if we transfer assets first into an LLC, mm -hmm. we can make our client the manager of that LLC. And then when that LLC is transferred into a trust, he's still the manager. So he still on a daily basis controls mm -hmm. all of the LLC's assets without having any ownership interest in those assets. So very frequently used structure com combining the LLC and the trust. Gotcha. Okay, interesting. Um, so you got the you got the control maintained at the LLC level. So here, here, here's my thought process. The, the trust, I think, sounds kind of like a, to the extent it may even be, it's a, it is a little bit of that security through obscurity in the sense that you're making someone poke around to figure out where your stuff went. And you can legitimately get them a statement saying, not mine. Unlike with the LLC, right, so, if I'm repeating it back to you, it is yours. They just can't necessarily attach it depending on the jurisdiction. So to answer it in an indirect way, uh, you do have to be very mindful of who is your creditor, right? Who is coming after your assets? Mm -hmm. Because depending on who that is, they, they will exercise a different degree of diligence in looking through the structures that have been set up at uh, figuring out what your assets are, right? So if you are being pursued by a government, government agency, right? It may be very different than being pursued by a bank. Mm -hmm. So for example, since COVID started, we've represented so, so many uh, clients who either own real estate or who operate retail businesses or restaurants, um, lenders, uh, owners of shopping centers, pretty, pretty much anyone who at some point in time borrowed money and signed a personal guarantee on that loan, right? Now needs asset protection because of COVID. 
because uh, you know everything is collapsing. Uh, so that bank that will be coming up for those borrowers is going to be a lot more aggressive than let's say most government agencies will be. But then did I hear that right? The bank will be more aggressive than the government agencies. That is correct because wow. one is a private capitalistic enterprise and the other is a bureaucracy, right? If you think of any government agency, it doesn't matter if it's the IRS or the FTC or the SEC, FDA, and some of them are much more aggressive than others uh, in pursuing assets. But still, at none of those agencies would any government bureaucrat get a commission mm. for successfully collecting on a judgment against the citizen, right? So we've represented so many clients uh, facing claims from uh, U.S. Customs for, let's say, uh, unpaid dumping penalties or uh, SEC violations or FTC violations, what have you. And these agencies are usually super aggressive initially in prosecuting lawsuits and getting judgments. But once that judgment is obtained, they're often not that aggressive in collecting on those judgments. I, I think like U.S. Customs has something like two billion dollars worth of uncollected unpaid dumping penalties because no like u.s government agencies do not sell uh their uh obligations to outside collection agencies mm -hmm. some municipal governments do that some state governments do that but not the federal government and no one is motivated to collect right so a private plaintiff a private creditor uh, is always going to be more diligent more aggressive mm. so gordon here a question for you if you were to guess who is who would be the scariest creditor for us to go up against? What would be the most formidable creditor? I, I would guess to... IRS. Uh, the IRS. Yeah, would yeah be, I think you're gonna tell me I'm wrong. Revenue service would be like number five on the list. I would guess. I don't know. That, that you know you you just put. I, I had the I had the feeling when you asked the question that my answer is the common answer yet the wrong answer and that you're going to surprise us. And I honestly don't know. So I can't wait to hear. So I, I, I agree with you. It is the most commonly guessed answer, the IRS. Um, but first of all, the state agencies tend to be more aggressive. So like in California, the franchise tax board is going to be infinitely more aggressive than the IRS. Number one. Mm -hmm. um, the most dangerous predator uh, for us to go up against. Oh, yeah, I know. Like, Your ex-spouse. Not well, not, you don't need to make it that person. Oh, okay, ex -spouse, and I don't know. But yes, an ex-spouse is very, very true. So the ex-spouse will be the most formidable creditor to go up against because uh, for an ex-spouse or for an ex-business partner also, it's not just about the money, right? It's about righting a wrong. It's about justice, right? Mm -hmm. And often money becomes sort of a side issue, right? They just want to like, you know, get our client, so to speak. So that's a very difficult creditor to go up against, right? So whenever we are setting up these structures, LLCs, trusts, you know, lots of other stuff, we always consider who is the creditor who will be coming after a client, because that tells us how intelligent they are, how aggressive they will be, how well funded they will be, how diligent they will be, which greatly impacts what it is we do to protect the client's assets, right? So let's briefly go back to trust and then we can move on to more esoteric. Well, I'm sorry. Did you answer who the number one most aggressive is? Did I miss that? Well, no, I agreed with you. It's the former spouse. Got it. Okay. Got it. And from a, from a U.S. government agency perspective, who's the most aggressive? I heard you say states on a federal level. On the federal level, I would say probably the Federal Trade Commission uh, would be the most aggressive. They are notorious for freezing assets as soon as they launch an investigation. So for example, mm -hmm. we represented uh, an investment bank um, that uh, got hit with an FTC inquiry. And the very first thing that the Federal Trade Commission did, and this is, this is their you know standard uh, uh, operating procedure, they froze all the bank accounts. And once they froze all the bank accounts, our client could not pay their vendors. They could not pay their employees. They could not pay their lawyers. Everything is frozen. The investigation dragged on for six months. And the FTC said, you know what? We made a mistake. You guys are all good. We're done. Thank you. The client filed for bankruptcy because over six months, they just could not operate their business, right? So that's a super aggressive agency. Um, the SEC, uh, the FDA are also very aggressive. Uh, so we have, you know, represent clients a lot who are, let's say, uh, registered investment advisors uh, facing SEC uh, inquiries 
or the uh, run hedge funds or private equity funds, you know, as soon as they get that letter from the SEC, there's trouble on the horizon, regardless of how it will play out, because always a letter from the SEC will be followed by investor losses. So l let me ask a question. I, I understand that on U.S. federal tax returns, you have to set forth the foreign bank accounts you have, and there's huge penalties if you don't. Assuming you do that, is there any reason why someone playing in this area wouldn't keep the majority of their banking assets offshore? Not even for asset, I mean, I guess for asset protection, not, not, in a, not to fool with the IRS, but just to keep them beyond those, I guess, in REM or attachment orders. Well, so let's just jump then into offshore planning uh, since he gave me the segue for it anyway. And then we'll come back into trust indirectly through offshore planning and explore them a little bit more. Okay. Uh, because there are some important things I want to say about trust. Um, so the answer, the brief answer to your question is yes. If you are looking for answer protection and if you have liquid money, that should be overseas. So let's explore why that is the case. And by the way, when I say overseas, it doesn't mean that it needs to be outside the, of the United States. Overseas in kind of this more global context of this podcast means in a different country from where you are. Mm. Right. So if our clients are in Western Europe, you know, we may want to move their money to Singapore. And if our clients are in the United States, we may want to move their money to Europe. Right. It's fine. We just want them, want the funds and the structure to be in a different country to make it very difficult for a plaintiff and a creditor to go after uh, our client's assets. So why offshore? You know, what's the advantage? So there are two advantages. One is uh, the technical advantage, meaning that there are countries that you know, have enacted laws to make it more difficult for a plaintiff or a creditor to pursue assets, right? So laws that are specifically purposefully asset protection oriented. So uh, let me take, for example, uh, one of my favorite jurisdictions where we set up a lot of offshore trusts nowadays uh, is St. Vincent uh, and the Grenadines. So we used to set up trusts in the Cook Islands like everyone else does. Mm -hmm. uh, we stopped doing that for the most part about 15 years ago and moved our uh, trust to St. Vincent. Why? Um, so first of all, we want a jurisdiction that has certain laws in place. Uh, and the Cook Islands is great in this respect. Uh, Nevis is great in this respect. Uh, St. Vincent, there are a couple of other countries that are really good at this. So we want a jurisdiction that will not recognize a foreign judgment when it comes to trust established in that jurisdiction. So for example, if we established, if we establish a trust in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and we fund that trust with assets coming out of Europe, out of the US, out of Asia, uh, St. Vincent will not recognize, they will not enforce a judgment with respect to this trust that was entered in another country. They will force the plaintiff to relitigate that case in St. Vincent, which nobody wants to do or impossibly can do because there's no jurisdiction uh, against our client in St. Vincent, only jurisdiction against the trust itself. Uh, we want a jurisdiction that makes it pretty much impossible to uh, establish a fraudulent transfer. We want a jurisdiction that gives us a very short statute of limitations on challenging a transfer of assets into an asset protection structure. And, you know, there are lots of other provisions. So first of all, we're looking for a jurisdiction that makes it technically more difficult uh, to attack the structure, right? And so far, we've just talked about the structure itself, like the legal part of the structure, right? what we set up in St. Vincent. Then there is the, uh, is that a rag doll next to you, Gordon? Uh, that's my cat, Kira, who is fascinated by this conversation. Excellent, as am I. Um, yes. She looks like a rag doll. Um, no, she's the most beautiful cat in the world. And, you know, stay, stay on topic. Come on, be nice. Okay, stay on topic. Okay, well, <laughs> you soon have cats running around. Um, okay. So we talked about where the, the trust is, right? And what laws are in place uh, to protect the trust from credit claims. Then we also need to focus on where will the money go, right? The money itself needs to go into some other country. So for example, if our client is somewhere in the United States, first part of the offshore planning process is to locate a structure overseas. So this, this trust may be in St. Vincent and the St. Vincent trust may own, let's say, a Nevis limited liability company. And now this Nevis limited liability company will own assets. 
So these assets should be outside of the United States, which means that uh, offshore structures are not suitable for owning real estate because real estate will always be in the United States and no US judge is gonna care where the ownership structure is located because he has jurisdiction over US real estate. So we want liquid assets that can be moved outside of the United States or whatever country you live in, right? Under the laws of some other jurisdiction. So what countries do we want to go to? Uh, well, again, it depends on where our client is coming from. Uh, if you are coming out of Europe or Asia, the world is your oyster. And you can locate that bank account or this investment account pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, the United States actually becomes a great choice. And again, as I said, we've seen a ton of foreigners moving their funds into the U.S. because of our strong banking privacy laws. Mm -hmm. We demand banking information from every other country, but we do not provide it to any other country, right? Uh, so very kind of privacy focused here, surprising. Uh, sorry, am I hearing that quickly? We don't provide it to any or we're, we're absent a treaty we don't? We do not provide banking information. Period. So the United States takes banking secrecy very seriously. Wow. Uh, and uh, the United States does not disclose banking information to other countries. But hmm. we require other countries to provide it to us. Because we're the US. Yes. Got it. The awesome aspect of being an American. Uh, we can force other people to do what we tell them to do. Uh, <laughs> well, yes, my friend. Come back to politics later, perhaps. Um, Jake, so, Jake, just quickly, does that include Switzerland then? Because I'm in the United Kingdom. Right. So, if you are in the UK, listen, Switzerland is still a great jurisdiction uh, for banking. We still have a lot of clients who bank in Switzerland, but it's certainly not what it used to be, right? Uh, until the UBS case some uh, 10 years ago, we all saw Switzerland as the gold standard of international banking, right? And there was this uh, common uh, con conception that once you send money uh, to Switzerland, it disappears into some vault deep below Bahnhofstrasse and no one will ever find it. And that's just not true anymore, right? So we know that every Swiss bank now will uh, provide information to the tax authorities both to the Swiss tax authorities and the tax authorities in the, to the, in the UK, like to the Inland Revenue Service, to our Department of Treasury. Um, they do that. And then in our experience, when we have seen clients who had Swiss accounts in place at Swiss private banks, when they were pursued by plaintiffs and creditors, what will be the very first thing that any Swiss bank will do? Close the account. Get out. Well, first of all, they're going to roll over and peel over themselves right? Mm -hmm. And then they're going to freeze the account. They're going to refer the case to their banking regulator and say, you deal with this. And until the banking regulator finishes dealing with that, the bank account remains frozen. So maybe the plaintiff doesn't have access to that account, but neither does our client. So even for the money part, we want a jurisdiction that will make it more difficult uh, for a plaintiff. Uh, to either grab that money or to find that money or to scare the bank into freezing the account. So we don't use Switzerland nearly as much as we used to uh, prior to the UBS case. Go ahead, um, Jacob. And what about, what about Cyprus, sorry, for, for trust setup? So, you know, we... <laughs> I mean, I'm interested in these questions them. also, so I'm, I'm letting us get off our regular scheduled program. No, no, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm curious also. Um, you know, I, I, repre I represent one of the world's wealthiest and best known families. I mean, the name that everyone knows. We set up a, a Cyprus entity for them for you know, some of their assets in Europe. And we want to open a bank account in Cyprus. This was a year and a half ago. We're still working with the Cyprus bank. And, you know, our law firm has a, a large office in Cyprus, well connected. Uh, you know, they're pushing it through. A year and a half, we've been trying to open a bank account for one of the world's, you know, leading best known families. You know, you know super totally legitimate business, just very boring, plain vanilla business. Uh, Cyprus banking is extremely difficult uh, nowadays. The Cyprus banks are so scared of money laundering, you know, making sure they follow all the KYC requirements is, you know, we just started avoiding Cyprus uh, for that reason. Uh, so we still set up entities in Cyprus. So we sometimes will still set up trusts in Cyprus, 
but we will never bank on Cyprus because it's just impossible. Um, so surprisingly, a jurisdiction that we have started using over the past uh, five, six years has been Hungary. And no one would think of Hungary as a you know, financial safe, safe haven, uh, but it is. Um, and you know, it, it's gonna be too deep for the purposes of this conversation to get into why that is. Um, but let's just briefly say that the Hungarian government uh, having accumulated a lot of money themselves, the people in power, they wanted structures in place that will protect them and their financial accounts. And they've enacted laws that protect them and their financial accounts, but these laws have broad applicability. So we are able to set up really beautiful uh, investment management structures out of Hungary, uh, insured by Lloyds of London, you know, the whole thing with, you know, huge uh, amounts of coverage where a U.S. judgment or any foreign judgment will not be recognized by the Hungarians, where they will not freeze the accounts if there is an inquiry, where we will have an opportunity last minute to move money elsewhere if we need to, right? Um, it's, it's a very interesting uh, world we live in today, right? Because for decades, everyone went banking in Switzerland and set up offshore trusts in you know, the Caymans or in the BVI or in the, the Cook Islands. Today, it's a bit different, right? Uh, we used Caymans maybe for, for setting up funds and insurance companies, but not really asset protection structures. We use Nevis for all season irrevocable trusts. Uh, you know, we use St. Vincent's for trusts. So, and banking has changed a lot. Um, so, and we used to, for example, we used to bank for our clients in Hong Kong and Taipei and Singapore. And if you are from Europe, that's still possible. And we will still set up bank accounts for our European clients in Singapore. But we cannot do that for US clients because there are no banks left in Asia that want a US client. Right? Okay, let, me, let me pause it one second. I, I, think, I think we need to do another show with you, to be honest. Uh, because we have about half an hour left, I, I know I took the conversation offshore when you wanted to cover trust. Can you cover trust and then we'll open up to the group in general? And well, and get, get some yeah, we can kind of do both. Uh, sure, we, we can do both because uh, trusts are used in offshore planning a lot, sure. right? It's it's still that cornerstone, cornerstone structure, both in domestic and international asset protection planning. So going back to trust. So first of all, we want the trust that is irrevocable. Um, what does that mean? Irrevocable means that the person who set up the trust and funded the trust has not retained the right to get his assets back. Right, meaning that the transfer of the assets to the trust is irrevocable. Uh, and that's very scary if you think about it, right? And for pretty much, you know, for every client that I speak to about these structures, the idea of placing their assets into an irrevocable trust, that's a scary proposition. Everyone wants to retain control over their assets. So how do irrevocable trusts work? Because our objective, as I said from the beginning, is not just to make the assets unreachable, but to allow our client to retain control over his assets. So over the past uh, 10, 20 years, depending on, on the jurisdiction you're in, um, this new concept in trust law has been developed and I would say perfected by now. And that's the concept of the trust protector. So a trust protector is an office that we create within the trust relationship. This is in addition to the trustee. And the trust protector is given certain very broad kind of more strategic powers over the trust. Um, the concept of the trust protector originated in the British Commonwealth jurisdictions um, in the Caribbean and the South Pacific and slowly made its way uh, to the US, to the UK and uh, to other countries. So the trust protector originally was intended as someone that you appoint to look over the trustee's shoulder to make sure that the trustee is doing what they're supposed to do. And hence that name, uh, the title trust protector, they're actually intended to protect the trust from the trustee. Uh, over the years, we've realized, we as you know, the legal planning community, we've realized, well, there are other things that the trust protector can be entrusted to do. So fast forwarding to today, what are the powers that are commonly given to the trust protector? Well, it will be the power to terminate the trust will be the power to revoke the trust and return the assets to whoever funded the trust. It will be the power to change the beneficiaries of the trust, the power to change the trustee of the trust, the power to change any provision of the trust agreement, 
the power to change the governing law or the tax treatment of the trust, to force distributions, to veto distributions, so on and on and on. It can be some of these powers, it can be all of these powers, but the beauty of the appointing a trust protector is that through that trust protector, we retain the ability to get our assets back. We retain the ability to control what happens to our assets on the current basis while they're sitting in the trust. And we never need to worry that the assets are somehow irrevocably gone. We retain control. Now, our client, the one who, let's say we are worried will be sued, cannot be the trust protector. He cannot himself or herself hold all of these powers. It should always be someone else. But that someone else can be a friend, it can be a family member, it can be a professional trust protector. Nowadays, there are companies that are professional trust protectors. Um, and the only power that our client retains and the only power our client needs to retain is the power to remove the trust protector and replace the trust protector with someone else that they trust. And so long as you have control over the trust protector, you have control over the trust and the assets of the trust, right? So every, you know, irrevocable trust, at least that I've drafted over the past 10 some years, and there have been hundreds of them, have incorporated the trust protector because every single client wants to retain control over his assets. Jacob, and this is true for question. domestic trusts and foreign trusts. Question. Hey, Pankaj, I, I, it's my fault. It's just because I have another recording coming up. I have a conference. I just need to manage the time on this one. Just hold tight for a second, if you don't mind. And I want Jacob to finish this part I and then we'll open it up. The non I just wanted to get the non tangibles like IP, like your skill set. Can that be put into a trust? If you're a lawyer, you have your IPs, your knowledge. Can you put that into the trust? And, you know, we talked about the tangibles. What, what about the non tangibles? So uh, this would need to be intangible assets that we are worried that a plaintiff may take from us, right? What are the assets that we actually need to protect? Well, we only need to protect those assets that someone can take from us. No one can you know, force you uh, to give them your knowledge, right? That, that just doesn't work that way. No one can force you to work for them, right? And use that knowledge to... Uh, so usually the, these will be uh, assets that can be attached by a creditor. Maybe intangible assets like a registered trademark or a copyright or a patent, right? Or an intangible like uh, an ownership interest in a legal entity. But it does need to be something that a plaintiff can actually can take from you and would want to take from you, right? So my knowledge as a lawyer, limited as it is, you know, what would a plaintiff do with it and how would they actually take it from you, right? There's a mechanism uh, for that. Um, so for trust, let's just finish it off and I guess we open it up for questions, right? Gordon? Yes. Okay. Um, so for trust, the idea is that once we transfer assets into an irrevocable trust, again, wherever in the world this trust is located, uh, the idea is that we no longer own that asset. It is now owned by the trustee of the trust. Uh, and we want the trust to be irrevocable, right? And we want to retain no uh, avert powers over the trust. All of the powers should be indirect um, uh, through the trust protector, right? And we just want to retain the power to remove and replace the trust protector. Um, let's let's open it up for questions. I mean, there's a lot more I can say, obviously. I sometimes- I, I, I think we need round two, class. to be honest. Okay, everyone, so we have, just to set the table, we have between 15 or 20 minutes and then I have to jump out on my panel. So Jacob, that was fantastic. I, I was, I was held in rapture by your comments. Uh, Marco, I, I, I think we're going to start with you because my, my, my man in the Caymans. <laughs> um, so uh, fascinating um, exploration of the individual um, well, asset protection uh, concept. Uh, I'm dealing with several situations right now. Uh, I'm personally in the Caymans for obvious reasons, um, mostly uh, tax uh, and the incredible simplification of your accounting that happens when you no longer have to account for tax. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the structure I, I'm trying to figure out is when you want a group of people to be able to act as a group, but without having the uh, overt um, or obvious 
uh, possession of assets that may or may not be of significant wealth. And this, this kind of scenario comes up often, as you can probably imagine, in the crypto space. Um, and a structure that I've been exploring, um, which I've actually just modified slightly after listening to this call, uh, was a UK LLP, uh, where every participant in this collective, whatever that collective might be, uh, is a limited partner registered with the LLP as a Delaware LLC. No, I'll, I'll, give a little, I'll, give a little quick, I'll give a quick disclaimer. Just to be clear, no one here is a client of Jacobs and he's not giving legal advice for you. He's speaking in generalities. Uh, speaking uh, speaking thank you, thank you, Gordon. Hypothetical. <laughs> purely hypothetical. Yes, purely hypothetical. Yes. Yes. Um, asking for so first of all, we're all jealous of you that uh, you're in the Cayman Islands and we are not. Uh, yes, it looks like it's a lovely- Not an American island. citizen. Um, so listen, uh, first of all, there is no perfect structure for anything, right? But what you've described, sure. it's a good structure. And certainly we do engage in asset protection planning, not just for individuals, but also for corporate enterprises, including some you know, billion dollar companies, uh, nonprofits, I mean, everyone from time to time needs asset protection. So for you, if you're putting together, let's say a group of crypto investors, yeah, what you've described is perfectly fine. You have a couple of layers of legal entities. Uh, you have some degree of anonymity, some degree of asset protection, and then your various investors can explore for themselves uh, how they own their Delaware LLCs. Do they own them directly or through a trust or through some other structure? And there are lots of other structures out there. So the, 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 I guess the goal here is that you want to keep the LL, LLP uh, reasonably uh, safe from uh, attack directly, which I believe LLPs in the UK generally uh, are very safe from external attack um, with respect to their partners, that is. Um, Correct. And then and each, the UK of course, LLP will be very similar to, let's say, a US LLC, right? There is no general partner. Uh, and, and you have, uh, you know, the same body of law that protects you from creditors coming in and taking over the management of, of the partnership. I think with proper drafting, you can have a UK lawyer built in even more protection into your LLP agreement, right? To make it mm -hmm. more difficult for a creditor of one of your investors from coming in and somehow disrupting uh, your fund. Uh, but you know, other than that, uh, it's a fine structure. All right. Thank you. Did what you do you hear think that, about Gordon? the ex-CEO of Google becoming a citizen of Cyprus? I think Eric Schmidt just made that move. Did he? Yep. Jacob, did he dump his US at the same can time? Can you imagine what his motivation set was? So, uh, you know, I just kind of as an aside, uh, since the election has started, we've had quite a few clients uh, approach us looking to protect themselves, you know, and ensure themselves against the outcome of the election. So uh, even before Biden was elected, a lot of people were planning for Biden getting elected right. and then taxes going up and some sort of confiscatory policies. So we actually recently, uh, a couple of months ago, represented a U.S. senator who wanted to move his very considerable wealth uh, outside of the United States. Because, it doesn't you know, rhyme with Romney, right? I'm sorry? It doesn't Romney rhyme doesn't. with Mitt Romney? <laughs> no, right. somewhat yeah. less considerable wealth. <laughs> okay, got it. He's pretty considerable. Yes. Interesting. Uh, I think Rick raised his hand. Rick, you want yes, to- Yes, thanks. Go ahead. Um, I have two questions, so feel free to take either or both. Um, one is uh, a friend is setting up um, like a hedge fund in the UAE, but he's an American citizen. Um, anything special about that to protect his earnings? Um, and the other is I'm interested in, besides the downside protection that you're um, helping us with, um, how might a jurisdiction help us um, in the development of a solution? For example, um, Puerto Rico has very favorable tax laws, as you know. They also have an R&D tax credit that's effectively a 50% a one-to-one -one matching grant. Um, so are there any jurisdictions that provide both the downside protection that you shared with us and, and maybe helping us on the upside? I apologize if you answered this before I, I came late. No, I, I have not. Very, very interesting questions. 
Uh, yeah, so for your friend who is setting up an, an offshore uh, private equity fund, um, I think it's uh, similar somewhat to Marco's question, right? How do we structure it uh, to protect it? So whether the fund is in the UAE or anywhere else in the world, uh, I mean, obviously, first of all, you want good lawyers locally to set that up, right? And build the protections into the fund agreement for you as the promoter. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure in the UAE, that's probably <laughs> quite possible. But then uh, the next question is how, how do you own your interest in the fund? And perhaps your friend would not want to own his interest directly in his name, but through some sort of an intermediate structure, whether it's an LLC or a trust or a combination of both. Um, so that, that's one. Um, and then as to the second question, what countries give us both downside protection and, uh, uh, you know, listen, all of the countries that people use uh, for offshore trusts usually will be tax havens or low tax jurisdictions. Like Cyprus, for example, right? Uh, it's a low tax jurisdiction. They will tax you on local earnings, right? They're not going to tax you on um, income source to outside of Cyprus. The same is true in St. Vincent, where we set up a lot of trusts. Same is true in Nevis and the Cooks or Caymans and you know, many of these jurisdictions. Uh, Puerto Rico is interesting uh, because you're still within the United States and you're still a U.S. taxpayer, but not now subject to the same laws as all the other U.S. taxpayers. Right. right. So, and we've been exploring recently, like setting up these so-called Ding and Ning trusts, uh, not in Delaware, Nevada, or in Wyoming, but setting them up in Puerto Rico to see if that's possible. Uh, you know, to get around both the income tax and the federal, uh, sorry, the state and the federal income tax, without actually having physically to move to Puerto Rico, just moving your trust there, uh, right. and the trust income. So. You know, it's a very fact-specific question you're, you're asking, but usually, yes, there are jurisdictions that can give us uh, various benefits. Let me just jump in one second. Just, just for everyone who's on this and everyone watching the recording, the, the show notes of this broadcast, we're going to put this on YouTube, and the show notes are going to have how to reach Jacob and Bob and do something with his fantastic knowledge. So... Just gonna throw that out there, and then Jacob, I'm, I'll put your LinkedIn, I'll put your office information, I'll put everything on there, just so oh, thank you, Martin. Just so good conversations can continue. Um, st still open for questions from the from the peanut gallery. Akash, do you want to do you want to follow up on what you're asking? Was it was was that addressed, or do you want to in vague terms, hypothetical terms, describe the situation oh, you're looking at? The only reason I asked about the non tangibles was because I heard that you could put uh, your skill set into a trust. And for example, if you're, if you're um, actually, um, oops, sorry, I can't <laughs> at the moment. Um, um, the only reason is, yeah, you, you can then charge your skill sets out and, and they become part of the trust rather than, you know, you having to pay tax yourself on the on your skill sets. That's the reason I asked that question. Jacob, is that maybe more like a personal services corporation that owns yeah, this could, trust? Could be something that's UK specific. I have not heard of anything like that uh, in the United States. Um, so I, I can't really answer that question about UK law. No worries. Thank you. Of course. I'm happy not to answer lots of questions. Ah, amazing. Um, anyone else in the audience with a question? Don't be bashful and we can always speak hypothetically about your friend. I think that, I think people are- Oh, bashful. I could go on. <laughs> uh, Marco, go, go for it. We, we, we got it. We, we're, we're down to the last couple of minutes. So this will we'll end on a high note. Which is you? Well, um, I'm I'm curious whether you have any insight into the de the delta between a UK LLP, and I'm sorry if I'm if I'm taking you out of your comfort zone by standing outside the US, um, but uh, UK L LLP uh, versus a uh, a UK LP uh, private fund LP. Sorry. You know, we don't set up funds in the UK, so my knowledge of that is very very limited. And I will likely do you a disservice if I try to answer your question. Uh, but I'll be happy to introduce you to okay. one of our partners in London. 
And actually, Jacob, why don't you take a moment to explain <laughs> Great. Alliance Law? Am I saying that correctly? Or Alliance. Well, listen, we are we are a law firm, like many other law firms. Uh, we are fairly global. I think we're in about 20 countries, uh, mostly in Europe, um, and focused well, largely on uh, cross-border work, so on cross-border business transactions, uh, international law, uh, cross-border litigation, things like that. So anything that's going cross-border, that's a large focus of uh, the law firm's uh, practice uh, for, for every office. And I think what you're alluding to in your response to Marco is that even if you're, you kind of stick to your lane, even though your lane is great, but you know you have access to other resources in other lanes. So if you had to dive into say a niche issue of UK law, you have someone available for yeah, that. Yeah, in most every country we are fairly well connected with local, you know, lawyers, accountants, financial services community. So uh, we we can answer most any question, but maybe not right away. <laughs> well, that's okay. A question given right away is usually a non-billable question. Hi, Pat. <laughs> Um, all right, everyone, I, I think we're good. And again, my apologies, I, I got to dump into my own seminar. Um, Jacob, you're, this was very well done. Really appreciate it. Re appreciate your time, appreciate your wisdom. That was, I learned a lot personally. Uh, Sandra, do you want to land this plane? Yeah, I, I think this was really a good show, different subjects. Uh, I didn't know Jacob before, you, you spoke highly of him and listening to, to this, you know, and this is a different cup of tea for, for, for my uh, background, but, you know, really cool. I think we should get you, Jacob, again in the show and maybe with a combination of one of the, uh, one of the other uh, speakers, but I really appreciate the, the value you brought to this, to this conversation. So we will post it on the, on the channels. We will also get your contact details if, you, if you're okay with that uh, in the subscription of, of, of that so people can share your your info, the, we, we can share the, the video link with the community. Um, and besides thanking you, Jacob, so for being on the show at such an early time. So thank you for that. Uh, I oh, think- My pleasure, does, guys. Thank you for having me. That was wonderful. Yeah, really appreciate it. And, and I think on behalf of Gordon and myself, we also like to appreciate everyone that was here during the live show. So again, Marco and all of the others that were here, Richard, Alexis, Mark, Derek, uh, Pankai, Jeff, uh, Sergey was also here. Really appreciate you guys. Um, please, you know, um, um, like and know. subscribe. Tell your tell yeah. your friends. <laughs> Ex exactly. We we need people to join the Telegram channel. We need people to subscribe on the YouTube channel and to share whatever we are broadcasting because this is all uh, all about you know sharing back with the, with the industry and getting other people excited on what we're excited about. So I think this is it for now, Gordon. I know you need to go to... This call to... usually goes another 40 minutes. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm in the Malta Summit. I'm talking about... The, <laughs> what am I going to do with all this time? We need to have Jacob again. All right. God bless everyone. Have a wonderful day. Jacob, thank you so much. Sandra, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Talk to you later. Take care. Bye. Bye. See you guys.